Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, make us worthy to remember the faithful departed, who professed their faith in you and received your body and blood as nourishment and blessings. Grant them rest, and may they share in your eternal banquet and in your everlasting joy. Count them among your chosen ones, and may they raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the one who raises the dead and awakens those who sleep in the dust, to the judge of the living and of the dead, to the God of spiritual and earthly beings who is professed, worshipped, and glorified, the one God in three divine persons. To the good one be glory and honor on this day of their blessed commemoration and of all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, when you reward those at your right hand and judge those at your left, may the faithful departed who were clothed in you at baptism received your body and blood as blessed food on the path to eternity, be worthy to meet you with radiant faces. May they rest in your heavenly Jerusalem, the city of all the saints, in the dwellings of light and joy. Now, O Lord, we implore you with the fragrance of this incense, and with alms, prayers, and sacrifices offered on their behalf to exalt them all upon your spiritual altar. Be pleased with what we have offered and prepare us to share in the dwellings of joy to which we have been invited. Through the abundance of your mercy and because of our perfect faith in you, we glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. Oh, 
The giver of life in your loving kindness and tender mercy, you descended to the realm of the dead, bringing it life and resurrection. We ask you to accept the fragrance of our incense and our prayers. Place at your right hand the departed who believed in you and give them rest in your glorious dwellings, that with the living they may worship you, glorify your divinity, and thank you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. <laughs> to the dead in the shadows of the grave. Save me from all pain and fear. Make me worthy of your feast. Grant eternal rest to the reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and to children forever. Brothers and sisters, concerning times and seasons, you have no need for anything to be written to you. For you know yourselves very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief at night. When people are saying peace and security, then sudden disaster comes upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness for that day to overtake you like a thief. For all of you, are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the light or of the darkness, of the night or of the darkness. 
Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us stay alert and sober. Those who sleep go to sleep at night, and those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet that is the hope of salvation. For God did not destine us for wrath, but to gain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, as indeed you do. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I heard a voice from heaven say, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. to the praise, the glory, and honor of the Most Holy Trinity. We go in this sense. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. <clears throat> From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Lord Jesus says, there was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and in fine linen, and he dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And from Sheol, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off with Lazarus at his bosom. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. And Abraham replied, My son, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, and while Lazarus likewise received what was bad, but now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. And he said in reply, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that they may, he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. 
But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. But he answered, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither then shall they be persuaded, even if someone should rise from the dead. This is the truth, peace be with you. Moreover, between us and you a great chasm is established. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This image that our Lord gives in the parable of the chasm between the blessedness of the kingdom, Abraham's bosom, and the torment that the rich man goes in his selfishness, the chasm between is what you have in the icon portrayed on the back of the bulletin of the fire. You have the man who's in the boat, and he's surrounded by fire. The fire is not hell. It is this chasm, this moment of sheol, of after death, of what happens to the dead we don't know exactly. We have a hope for the day of judgment and of resurrection. In the Latin church, they've tried to pinpoint and put all kinds of more details on. But in the East, we have what we have in the scriptures of what our Lord teaches us. There is death, and you notice the prayers that are handed down to us from our ancestors is we pray these, this day and this week for those who have passed into that world, into that chasm, in hope in our Lord. That's the big key. Notice that the, the feast is not announced as being the commemoration of all the dead. It is the commemoration of all the faithful departed. And so in the combination of all of the prayers that we have, I've often mentioned to you that if we're not working consciously to think as Christians, to think as Catholics, if we're not consciously making that effort in the modern world, then we're guaranteed to not be thinking as Catholics. And we can take the next step. If we are not consciously aware of what we do in our traditions as Maronites, then we're not acting as Maronites. And the reason why I make these statements is because the world that surrounds us is neither Catholic nor Maronite. It's not Christian, the world that surrounds us, especially not in Maine. But the vast majority of the people have no religion whatsoever or they're beginning to worship the trees and the rivers, whatever. But they're not Christian and it's not embracing of the gospel. And hence, as I mentioned to you last week, we were going to talk about our traditions and our customs around death. And so when we speak about the prayers first, it's important to understand that for the Maronites, death and what we do is accompany the dead. And hence, in the icon, the man is in a boat. He's traveling in death. And we accompany the dead in three primary stages. But in the books that we have of these long hymns, they go on forever, they're very long and actually many times repetitive. Bishop Dwight, in making his commentary on them, he says even at times monotonous. Because what you're doing is it's a voice between the dead and the living continually to help them move towards the kingdom in the fullness. And so in the combination of all these prayers and hymns that we have, they're known as the kole, imbayone, dal cabre, dandine. The hymns of consolation on over the graves of the departed. Now, if you've been to funerals before, I always explain the term that we use in Arabic is jinaz. But jinaz is not really an Arabic word. I mean, it is now, but its origin is not Arabic. And no one knows exactly where the jinaz word comes from, but the suspicion and what it seems to be, because the Muslims will even use the same term when they're dead, jinaz. 
But in the Syriac tradition, we speak of the dead not as being someplace else. They're in a different state of existence. But they are just to us unseen, genize. And so the dead are, genizo is translated sometimes as invisible, unseen. And so that term is applied to the dead. They have died, their bodies have been exhausted, we have laid their bodies to rest, but they're still with us. That's why in our anaphoras we always point out, our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, our teachers, all those who have gone before us, we remember. They are with us. They surround us. And they are part of what we do. And so this journey and companionship is to understand the very foundation of what we do as Maronites in helping and working with the passage and accompanying to the dead. And what surrounds the dead, you'll notice in the Husoyo. We talk about our prayers. We talk about our good works that we do in their name. And the sacrifices, the fasting that we make. Those are the three classic works. And starting next week with the great fast, of course, those are the things that should be on our mind. Prayer, fasting, and alms, what we call alms. Alms is not money. Alms is compassion, works of mercy. Maybe money, but money is only one form of showing compassion. Even the poor can be compassionate. If there's not even a penny in their pocket, they can still do alms. And so what, the, what surrounds the dead then is these actions. Even the mercy meal is part of the alms that we do. It's not a luncheon for the family. That's why we call it the mercy meal, but we'll get to that in a moment. And as we mentioned last week, and we've considered in the preparation for death, of course, when someone is ill or through old age, they're languishing. We remember that we surround them, and if we don't have in our homes, we should have holy water. And when someone is sick, especially if they're seriously sick, we should bless that room where they're in on a daily basis. And when someone truly is sick, profoundly, probably dying, we say, then in the house, of course, if there's no oxygen being run, we should have a blessed candle that burns in the room with them. It's the reason why we have the blessing of the candles as we did a couple weeks ago for February 2nd for candle mass. These candles are a sacramental, and, they, and the holy water and the candle make that this is a sacred space. And notice that the prayer is also for the candles that, that it expels darkness, that it expels the demonic, and brings peace and grace and blessings to the person who is in the radiance of these candles. Because we prepare them to pass from this world. For Christians, death is not a sad thing. It will strike us to the heart emotionally, yes, but it's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of a new stage. And so when we prepare, of course, we call in the priest, we make our confessions. We recount, we recognize all of our faults and our failings throughout our life, if we can remember them. And we place them before the mercy of God in the mystery of penance, especially if we don't do it during our lifetime. This is the moment for us in our confession. And then as we mentioned last week, our anointing. And then of course the great rosa, rosso, the great mystery of viaticum, to receive communion. And communion for the dying is specifically a different word. We just, it's essentially the same thing of course. But it has a different circumstance now that we refer to it as being viaticum, which is from the classical pagan Roman world. Via tecum. So it's one word now in English, but viaticum literally is via te cum, on the way, what is with you. And it refers to the days of the Roman Empire when you traveled. If you traveled any distance, you had to take with you what you were going to consume on this trip. You're not going to find Howard Johnson's along the road. And so you had to take with you the nourishment was necessary to make this trip. And so viaticum was the resumption of our divine Lord in the Eucharist to make the step on our next journey. Now, when the person passes away, of course, we prepare the body. Of course, these days we use funeral homes for the last hundred years or so, or a little over a hundred years in America. But I'll share with you an anecdote. To some of you, I've already done this, but when I first went over to study in Switzerland in the 80s, 
at the seminary. In Europe, funeral homes were not, you know, now they're ubiquitous now in America, but they weren't ubiquitous in Europe. People were still washing the bodies of their dead, preparing their, you know, grandmother's passed away, we prepare a body, and she's laid out in the parlor at the house, which is why we call them funeral homes, because they're replacing this action. And of course, at 22, I arrive in Switzerland and everything's brand new. They throw me in a country to speak French that I don't speak French. And they dump me in this place and I arrive at the seminary when one of the sisters in the convent attached to the seminary, she died like the day before. All right, well, oh, it's not like you haven't dealt with death before. And of course, you're not dealing with it directly and everyone's running around doing everything they need to do in French. Of course, I don't understand the thing that's going on, but what I did was watching everything. And in some ways, it was probably more beautiful because I couldn't talk to anyone. So I could just watch what they did. And those sisters, I wasn't there for the preparation, of course, of the body, but the sisters took sister's body, they washed the body, they regarbed it in a clean habit, changed the linens on the bed where she had died, and placed the body back in the bed where she had died just 12 hours before. And throughout that night, the seminarians, the priests, the sisters would go to that room in the convent and kneel down next to that bedside where her body lay in peace and pray. And throughout the night, everyone came through to say their farewells and also to pray for her passage. And the next morning, the seminarians came in. They lifted the linens with the body and brought the body over and placed it in the coffin in the same room. And then they carried the coffin to the seminary church where we had the funeral and then subsequently burial, burial at the crypt at the, sem at the seminary. And I thought it was stunningly beautiful. It had the intimacy of accompanying the dead which we've lost to some degree. Families always had a tradition. You always had, usually it was the matriarchs, that those who knew how to prepare the dead, wash, wash modestly, of course, and how to do this and then prepare for death. So this is the stage that we do in preparing for the death. Now, there's a reason why everyone talks about the catacombs in Rome and why they dug down below and radiated out to over 50 miles worth of tunnels are dug under the city of Rome and its vicinity. Both the Christians and the Jews. Because for all of its history, short of plague or war, we never burned our dead. We laid the bodies in repose because the bodies have been consecrated they have been anointed, and they have been the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Which is why throughout the centuries then, so when whichever woman was who died and gave her farm, which is now known as St. Calixtus Catacombs, it's just a farm area outside of the old city of Rome. Now, you could just start burying the dead on top and that would be fine, but it's not enough. That's why they went down and then out and radiating out to make these cemeteries subterranean. They're not hiding in them. They were just registered cemeteries, but they were there. And they were done because of that abhorrence of the destruction of the temple of God unnecessarily. Now, since the 1960s, we have been allowed to cremate the dead for serious reasons as Pope Paul VI said. It's not just simply, well, whether you want to have a body burial or a cremation, there must be a serious reason for this because you've destroyed the body, oftentimes before we even have the farewell. And of course, in cremation, the word means burning. But of course, our professionals among us can describe to you, it's not only burning, you also have bodies sent down to the coast in Maine that have chemical reduction. Your grandmother's is put in a tube and there's lye solution to dissolve all of the soft tissue and the muscles and the bones are brought out and pulverized and that's what you get back. And horrifyingly, grandma just gets put into the normal water system and goes to the water treatment at Booth Bay or wherever they have these shops. It's important to understand what we do with the dead. And so it was a great lesson for me at 22 to watch how they prepared sister's body 
with great love and great respect. Now, cremation is allowed. It's not to say it's not allowed. It is allowed for serious reasons. And of course, in Maine, oftentimes the serious reason is surely economics. We just, it's more expensive. And that's okay. But we should always be working to have the actual cremation be after we do the ceremonies of farewell of the funeral. And of course, that will also, be co that will also have cost involved. So that's why I have been in discussions. I've talked to our favorite funeral home, Gillens. And I have talked to our monks in Western Massachusetts. Officially, they don't make coffins, but I know that some of the monks make coffins. And so over this last year, between talking with Dana and John and then at the, at the funeral home, I've also been talking with Father Michael and the monks down at the monastery, that if we could as a parish own a coffin which will allow us to at least keep the bodies until after the funeral ceremonies. It cuts down the cost. Cremation may take place after the ceremonies are done, but we have the body to give the proper farewell to before its destruction. And Galanz has been very generous to accept that. And so hopefully sometime this summer we will have a coffin which will be available for the use of the parishioners of St. Joseph's. And the reason why we talk about making a coffin, because if you have a cremation, because financially you just can't make it in the proper way of doing the body burial, it has to be made so that the bottom can actually open so you can slide the corpse out after for the cremation. And so we have to have it made which isn't a problem. I'm more than happy to have to do this, but this is the extent that we should be thinking. If our ancestors dug 52 miles of tunnels to make sure they could bury their dead and not burn them like all of the Romans were doing, everyone in Rome burned their dead. And the Christians and the Jews, no. Because the pagans saw burning as being a purification ceremony. And the Jews and the Christians were horrified because there's only one person. And any more than I'd burn down my grandmother's house, I'm not going to burn her body. Even more of a reason not to burn. And so these are the extents that we will try to do these. And of course, at the wake, the body is there. We have the prayers of the wake in the Genes ceremony. And in the hymns, you have it already. It's a dialogue. And oftentimes, the verses, they alternate back and forth with the dead speaking to us in these prayers. We were able to do the full wake ceremony recently in Gardner. And it's quite beautiful when it's done fully. And of course, since I've arrived here in the last three years, I've had people ask me not to do any wake ceremony, no janaz, no, no prayers. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't do that. We don't do the manner per her request. There will be no services and no ceremonies. No, we're Christians. We don't do that. We, we have a farewell, not a celebration of life of just some kind of let's have a picnic but of a solemn farewell of respect and love and accompaniment. This is how the Maronites usher their dead to the next stage of life. And so that when the bodies are brought to the church, it's received at the church. Now, centuries ago, the bodies actually went from the home to the cemetery. We didn't have a church thing except for the clergy, but that was centuries ago. So now the bodies come and they're received Open your gates, O Jerusalem. And you have this hymn that is sung of the idea of the gates of the eternal Jerusalem of the firstborn, to receive what remains of this individual to bring them in. If you bring me a box of busted up bones, it's not the same thing. And that's why Bishop Dewahi in the 90s, when cremation became bigger and bigger and bigger in the 90s, you have to remember that even though cremation was allowed in the 60s, the ashes were never allowed to be brought to the church in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and in the 90s they started being allowed to come to the church. And proportionately speaking, statistically, wherever the population is a higher proportion of Catholics, there's always in the general population proportionally a lower rate of cremation. 
and the higher rate of non-Catholics than the lower rate that will be of body burials and the higher rate of cremations. So when I was in Fall River, one of our sister parishes, I did a lot of funerals there, almost one every single month. And they always brought a coffin. But Fall River is 85% Catholic. They just never crossed their minds. Which is why we have to make that conscious effort living in a country, in a, in a state, where the vast majority of the people have no sense of this. And so when the bodies are brought in, we have the Eucharistic sacrifice and the final genaz. That's why with the body present, we have the incense ceremony around, which is why Bishop Dwight in the 90s said, you can bring the cremated remains to the church. But the full ceremonies of the incensation of the body and all that are not done when there's no body. And so that's why the idea of making all the efforts so that we can have the bodies at least through the ceremonies and then do with them what you wish. But remember that Rome even reiterated all these things in 2016 to us to remind us that the body burial is the norm, cremation is acceptable, but it's not equal. And then Rome had to remind us also that those ashes that we have after cremation, nobody ever kept a body on their piano. It's impossible. But now we have a little box, it goes on the mantelpiece, it goes on the piano, it gets dumped in, in Uncle Whoever's favorite fishing hole. All of that is forbidden. The ashes have to be buried, they have to be. And so in 2016, Pope Francis had the Catholic world reminded there has to be proper disposition and repose to even if we have cremation, the proper remotes. Again, like I said, I don't have to say this about bodies. It's against the law to keep a body in your house, and so that doesn't work. So that's not a problem. But because over these last 50 years, the idea and understanding, you know, we have Catholics who have done things like this, put them in jewelry, put them in fireworks, dump them in lakes, sprinkle them over forest. None of that is allowed, and it's totally disrespectful to the bodies of the dead who have been consecrated and anointed. And the third stage, three stages, third stage, so when you know it's the third stage, you know we're coming to the end of this very long sermon. The cortege accompanies, again, historically with lots of hymns that you'd be singing all the way to the cemetery. And then the body would be reposed. And of course, oftentimes, and I've done this depending upon states or regulations of cemeteries or whatever, it's all different. But there have been places where we actually lower the coffin while everyone's present to do the burial. I've been places where people come up and they throw a shovel full of dirt in and they actually bury the person by the time you all leave, they're buried. So we do this in different varieties of different places, but in the ceremonies that we have and in these hymns that are sung, and as the coffin is to be lowered, the priest takes the soil from the ground, and as a form of a cross over the coffin, it says, dust you are, dust thou art, and to dust you now return, and yet you shall be born anew as it's lowered into the coffin, into the grave. Then we finish with a simp with simple prayer, the Kyrie eleison, and we finish accompanying those who have died in hope with the great prayer that our Lord taught us, the Our Father. And that's the end of the ceremony. But what I leave you with are the two details. We talk about mercy meal. The mercy meal historically is an act of alms where either the people in the village or the community would provide the meal for the family, so it's one less thing they have to worry about, naturally. But we don't call it a luncheon, we call it a mercy meal because it's meant to be an act of compassion, an alms done in the name of the deceased, in the name of the genizo, of the one that we no longer see. But we also call it a mercy meal because it's open. The homeless people had a falls wandering around up and down Front Street. Those people in the history of the Mercy Meal are also to be invited in. And you fed the village. You fed the people that came because it was an act of alms and the table was open in the name of this person as an act of compassion. That's the Mercy Meal. I leave you with one last detail because apparently we've all forgotten this one. 
It is the tradition for the Maronites to have masses offered for the reposed on the third, the ninth, the fortieth, and on the year anniversary. Now the fortieth, many of us still have. But the third day of repose, quite naturally, because it commemorates our Lord's resurrection from the tomb. The ninth day is the ascension in Pentecost, the nine days of prayer between our Lord's ascension and the coming of the spirit of life. And so on the ninth day, we offer the divine Eucharist. On the 40th day, the 40th day after the resurrection is our Lord's glorification at the right hand of the Father in the ascension. So on the 40th day, and on these different days again, historically, they would have another mercy meal and feed the poor in their village. And then, of course, on the year anniversary, when the calendar turns for 12 months all the way around, we once again say to our beloved Genizo another farewell with the Eucharist and a meal. Those are our customs. And it is beautiful, it is profound, and there are very deep reasons why we do these things. Shrugging our shoulders and saying, well, it's too much. It's not too much. And if, we are, and if we don't retain the Maronite tradition in Maine, then there's no reason for a Maronite community to be in Maine. God will keep us going as long as we are actually Maronites. And Maronites means in our faith, in our Catholic faith, in our orthodoxy, and in our Maronite traditions. So there, I lay them all out before you. There are some of them written up in the bulletin, not the customs in that. And I just encourage you, go deeper and deeper into these magnificent traditions of Antioch and be standard bearers of a very Catholic, of a very Christian, of a very compassionate and loving way that we escort our Genise to the next stage through the chasm as they move towards the kingdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial to the Father. Through him all things were made. The Holy Spirit was in fire and became For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death in his grave and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and dead, and his kingdom will not come. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
Telvot madem heida loho, valvot al loho dan khade kalyu, Vain absurvot aylu tau, keyul al vaita fresco dan khayet loho the sheets for the transfer hymn for the faithful departed. Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saints Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish, and especially of our repose. Remember also of all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Holy Father, grant security, peace, and everlasting love to your church, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the
bless us and make us worthy of the eternal reward reserved for men and women of peace. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. O oh Lord, we offer you these holy mysteries, that through them you may free us from the sufferings caused by sin, and enable us to work for justice, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. With heart, mind, and tongue we give you thanks, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one true God, joined spiritually to the invisible choirs and countless ranks of angels. Your faithful people glorify you with them, and three times they proclaim... Son, and holy is your Spirit. Through the incarnation of your Son, you saved the world and freed it from sin, and kept it from going astray. Through the eleison, vabiamo haudatum hasho dilema bedchayin, in sabe lachma beda o kodi shanto, o barachu Waksuya bilatal mi tau kodomara Sabahula mehene kulhu Hono deni tau Bahuru dil Dahlo faikun wahlov sagi metakasayo meti hem Hosoyan hame wa hoye Dal alam alamin. Ho kano alko so dam zikho men hamro hu men mayo. Barako kadesh. Abel talmi tau kadamara. Sabish tau mehne kulho. O no denita, de mohun dilan di antiki khadato, dahlo faiku wahlov sagie, et a shadow meti hand, kosoyon hame wa hoy, dal alam alamin. added these words, whenever you share in these holy mysteries, remember my death, burial, and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your O oh Lord, we do not forget the amazing events of your plan of salvation and of the fearful signs of your second coming, when you shall reward all people according to their deeds. 
Now your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, is that moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Ad in modio, man in modio, man in modio, unite modero chayo kadisho, unachen alainu aru korbono chono. Descends, he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. Make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries, O Lord, allow us who share in them to find joy in your presence. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Lord, be an invincible fortress against false teachings for your church and her shepherds. Assist our fathers, Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shada Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith. Blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, reward those who do good, free those bound by hardships, liberate the poor, and visit those who are dejected, distressed, and weary. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, be a fortification for every city and country that truly believes in you, and takes refuge in you. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your holy church, that you established on the solid rock of the true faith, and send her vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life. In a world of distractions, which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor, May those whom you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, strengthen those who call upon the mother of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the saints who have pleased you, especially St. Joseph, St. Marin, St. Jude, St. Charbel, through your grace, make us and our departed worthy of the eternal blessings that you have prepared for your saints. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, forgive the faithful departed who have been redeemed by the death of your only Son. And on that day when all are rescued from death, delivered from the realm of the dead and raised from the dust of the grave, the grace of your only Son will have been glorified in us and in them. Through him we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have forgiven, with or without full knowledge. O Lord, in the resurrection on the last day when all is renewed, make us and our departed worthy through your grace of the joy of your heavenly kingdom. In all and in all things, may your blessed and most honored name be glorified, praised, and exalted. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, 
now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. O Lord, open our mouths and lips, sanctify our bodies and souls, and purify our minds and consciences, so that we may call upon you, O Father of mercies, and implore you, praying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. O Lord, hasten to transform all that is harmful and detrimental into that which will help and benefit us, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing of the Lord. O Lord, may your graces, your blessings, and all your divine gifts descend in abundance upon your holy church, your parishes, monasteries, and convents, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord. For he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory. Forgiveness of sins and eternity. 
Thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for the wash of body to eat and your living blood to drink, lover of all people. Have mercy.
Holy Father, our mouths, accustomed to earthly food, give you thanks for your grace that has made us worthy of this heavenly food, the body and blood of your only Son. Through him and with him, glory, power, and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. O Christ, you are the heavenly bread who came down and became for us the food that does not perish. At your second coming, may we not become the food of the imperishable fire. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.